Welcome back to another episode of Buffalo Happy Hour. Mike, what's going on? Derek, we are back over at a friend's tasting room at Addie's. Fine Wine and Spirits located in the wonderful Billville. So, Addie's, thank you so much for having us. We greatly appreciate it. Um, but we do have new friends, new drinks, and new skews to talk about. So, do you guys want to introduce yourselves to our audience? Yes. My name is uh, John Balk. I'm a uh, sales associate here in the Western New York, Buffalo, Rochester area for Vivino Selections. And I am Catherine Kauchek, Vice President of Operations for Vivino Selections, based out of Pittsburgh. So Vivino Selections, what does that mean? What do you guys do? Can we take the lead on yes. this one? Okay. Why don't you? So um, we are actually started out as a distributor. We're just we're a smaller import company that was bogged down. We've all worked for larger companies, and we were bogged down and decided to start our own company and import our own wine and take our own control. That's really cool because yeah. the the wine industry is so large and there's so many different countries and just regions that make amazing wine and smaller wineries too. Do you guys you guys deal a lot with smaller wineries or are you more That actually is our main focus okay. is we go after the family independent smaller uh, traditional mm -hmm. wineries all across Europe. The focus of our portfolio is all old world. Okay. So old world versus new world, old world for people who out there listening who don't know, that is uh, Spain, Italy, France, Germany, Austria, uh, sometimes Greece, and then you start really getting into mm -hmm. the weeds in terms of other countries that make wine. But those are primarily the, the big boys. By old world, you just mean like traditional? Uh, I mean, that's where wine yeah, came sure, from. Okay. Gotcha. That's where yeah. what everybody thinks of as sure. of wine came from the old world. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, new world being anything in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. So you're talking United States, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and South America. Okay. Which and includes Argentina and Chile. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, so for us, we wanted to have a portfolio that was going to really give the best expression of so many of the different regions throughout Italy, France, and, and Spain in mm -hmm. particular. So the, uh, the wineries that we work with, yes, you're, they're not going to be on a, you know, a magazine cover anytime soon or anything like that. These are the unsung and hidden gems mm. that you know, if you have a, the right guide, you'll be able to find them in just about any store. But now, especially here at Addie's, correct. <laughs> nice plug. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yes, nice job. But um, the, the the really wonderful thing about about Vivino Selections is that the focus is on wine. We don't have any spirits, hmm. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, perhaps perhaps in the future, it's we don't know right now, but we really wanted to make it a very wine centric kind of a company. When did you guys start? Uh, we started in 2012. Oh, wow. Okay. And it started actually as a one-man show and then as a two-person show. I came on in 2013, and now we're up to seven people. So we're still a smaller company um, in terms of the inner workings of the company, but we actually are quite large as far as our sales are concerned and uh, the product that we have in our warehouse. So, Good for you guys. Yeah. So we try... What we try to do, our motto is to sell wine that people like, that instead of um, hitting numbers and being forced to hit numbers and selling things that you really don't like or don't support, it's actually selling things that work for the consumer and that you're proud of selling. Mm -hmm. So um, we feel in a turn and burn. Mm -hmm. It helps everybody out. It helps the consumer. It helps us. It helps the wineries. Um, and like to expound upon what John was saying, is 99% of our portfolio are family-owned wineries. They've been in their family for generations, and they still do the hand-picking, the organic, biodynamic, has always been instilled in the generations handed down. So they take great pride in what they do. So when, sorry, Mike, but when you started back in 2012, what was that 
process like? Like when, when that first individual started, was it we're sick of big distributors, let's do this? Or was it I see a need for smaller family-run wineries in Europe to come over here? Like what was that thought process like? I'm going to take a deep breath. Um, so Mark, who started the company, mm-hmm. uh, worked for the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board for about 27 years. And Pennsylvania is still a controlled state. So nothing enters or exits that border without Pennsylvania having some kind of say in it. Mm. So essentially it's a monopoly and there's one buyer. So he learned what the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board did. With that, um, in coordination with the bigger companies kind of losing sight of what they're supposed to do for the consumers, he decided that he wanted to start his own business. Gotcha. And that's where the focus came on the smaller, um, the smaller wineries. We actually started as a distribution company. So we pulled from another importer and sold their wines within Pennsylvania. And then because of wanting control and to build our portfolio with our own things, that's when we started importing in about 2018. I feel like you have to start there, though, with doing the distributing aspect of it, right? right. Because that's one where you learn the logistics of distributing and two, building those relationships. Because I'm sure that yeah. relationships was tough to right. start with. Very tough. Mm-hmm. Very difficult. Yeah. And again, in Pennsylvania, it's very it's very hard. You're going restaurant to restaurant to try to sell your wines. Sure. And there's six bottles here, six bottles there. So it's hard to build quantities. But now, uh, check me if I'm wrong, we, we're we in 14 states, aren't we? Correct. Yeah. And growing. So wow. from 20, it's in, in 10 years' time, to go from just trying to make it in terms of, you know, getting a toehold in the Pennsylvania market to now 14 states. It's, that's impressive. That's really cool. So, and, and how does it work with the, the family wineries demand and supply <laughs> aspects? Meaning, because mean, if, if they're going to say yes to working with you and then you have the portfolio that you guys have mm-hmm. with relationships here, is it a strain on them to produce the amount of wine needed to keep up with the demand? Or is that kind of just, we'll give you what's available based on this winery's output and you're not putting strain on the winery? Both. So, yeah. yes. So we deal um, with wineries that we deal with. We find out what their inventory is and what the levels that they can produce, and we work with that. And it seems to work out the relationship mutually. We kind of grow together. Hmm. So when we bring over a brand, they might have a small production on it. And as we grow and sell their brand, they also start growing their production of that brand. So it's a nice working relationship that we've had with a lot of them. And knock on wood, it's been pretty successful. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm sure that it's not just like a Google search of small wineries in Mm-mm. Spain. So, like, what is your vetting process? Do you have qualifications? Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Bring them we'll, on. Yeah, we'll take no. anyone. Um, what we do is we um, – it's, it's kind of been word of mouth. We started with some smaller producers, and from traveling, we found some smaller producers, and they told their friends. And so that process is – what they do is – um, they send their wines to us, and we sample the product, and we start thinking about whether it's something that the consumer would like. We look at the packaging, and then more importantly, the pricing. Mm-hmm. And if that works, then we start the process with uh, the TTB and um, getting the importation and getting it over to the U.S. Which that has to be fascinating because I would imagine when you first introduced yourself, you just kept rattling off different cities. And I'm like, here we go. Because it's got to be such a large <laughs> territory that you're essentially responsible for. Sure. Yeah. Is there anybody, are you also specifically going to Europe to meet with people? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, not yet. So is it is it basically because there's, um, what'd you say, 12 total employees? Seven. Seven. Seven, seven. seven total employees? I was the seventh. Understood. He's a newbie. <laughs> I am. Gotcha. He is. He's our latest. I literally started last. with this company back in March of this year. Oh, wow. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> the the border panel that you were discussing for the tasting, right? do you have anybody that goes and meets overseas? Mark or does, is it he? all? Mark originally, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The owner originally did. And it's funny when we say a panel taste, it's basically two or three of us. Or if we can get the collective group together, then we do it collectively. But That's usually cool. it's based on one or two people because i feel like that was a a massive aspect of you guys building that rapport and and mutual understanding with the families because it's way different from we'll just go meet with you know this local massive winery in uh, california yeah in napa valley it's just like this go meet with gallo yeah Yeah. it's like this is a family and Mm -hmm. you have to have that you know and they're going to go back generations absolutely so Mm -hmm. what was that process like 
So Mark started the process, and he started because uh, because of the distribution company. He was able to travel. An importer would take him on trips. Importers would take them on trips, and they would go visit the wineries and facilities of the wines that he sold. So through that travel, he developed relationships with the people at the wineries or their friends. Mm-hmm. They would say, so-and-so down the street has the same product or something. It doesn't compete with us, but it's in the price point that you're looking for. So then it became word of mouth. But originally it was travel and just kind of popping in to wineries and saying hi and talking and developing a starting relationship with it. That's great. I, f- I feel like it, it benefited you guys early on to have seven total people because right. you can relate to them. Oh, yeah. Like we're, yeah. Not, we're not big. Right. Like right. We're just trying to get your, your juice right. Right. to others that are going to also enjoy it, and yeah. it's just to help you out. You won't get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. No. You are important to us. Mm-hmm. Right. You're the only Tuscan producer that we have, or you're the only person from Ribera del Duero that we deal with. So yeah. you don't have 25 other SKUs that you're competing with. And get to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, the company is really, really good about making sure that – the representatives, whether they're the, the head of sales or the head of marketing or whoever it might be, or even the owner or the winemaker themselves, mm-hmm. to schedule a trip to come over here and you know work with us, mm-hmm. the salespeople out in the field. And that's such a great resource in terms of education. And since being with this company, I've probably met easily half a dozen to eight different folks from, uh, so many from Italy, it's crazy from La Marca, from Abruzzo, Veneto, uh, it, where you just have to sit and be a fly on the wall and listen to these folks speak while they're talking about all of their stuff. And it's like they paint the picture of what it's like. Uh, maybe the audiences can see behind us and stuff like that, but the the vineyard and what their day to day activities is, and it's it's really idyllic. Yeah, <laughs> and and you no know, doubt. very I, I get very jealous. Like, it's a oh, really I go work there. it's it's a really important learning tool. It really is oh, to is have them. Ever? If we is can't if we can't take the group over to visit them, then it's really nice that they come over and visit us. And it is such a learning experience. Mm-hmm. If yeah, you can't be at the vineyard. It's it's the next best thing. At that point, like you don't even have to sell it. It's just yeah. this guy right. selling right. or this girl selling it yeah. to everybody. The accent it's sells. awesome. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and then this is. That every, every once in a while you have to sort of uh, step in because you're like, okay, I could tell that this person like just reached the end of all of their English. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. now I'm going to come in because they, they they said what the wine is and so on and so forth and how it was made and everything sure. like that. But now the, to that language of like how to actually you know close, <laughs> right? <laughs> they, yeah, really. It's lost on them. But uh, it's it it's it's huge for folks like Tyler here at at Addie's and everywhere else that you go because it's one thing for a salesperson to tell you know a wine shop owner or a restaurant tour or something like that about a particular wine it's a whole other ball game when the winemaker or the person who is there on a day-to-day basis is like no 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 i can actually tell you like when this juice was pressed mm-hmm. and when we picked the grapes and mm-hmm. you know who the person was and so on and so forth there's so. a human connection to it right right you know whereas and i'm i'm not debunking or uh, that might be the wrong word. I'm not. I'm not getting down on the bigger companies or the larger yeah. companies because yeah. they're successful and they're successful for a reason. Exactly. But I think that human element has gotten lost, and this allows you to have that relationship with the wine itself. Yeah, and it's a little bit more uh, a, a numbers game for mm-hmm. them. You know, right? How many placings can, can I get? You know, sure. How many How many cases can I sell? Especially when it comes time to like to the holidays right now. Right. There are people, friends of mine, who you know do work for the bigger companies, and you look at them and you're like, Are you okay? <laughs> they're like, well, I, I'm so close. And you're like, all right, just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. It's just, we're selling wine here, man. We're supposed to have fun. <laughs> yeah, really. It's you a know. great job. I mean, it, it is, really it is. is. You're not selling paper clips, and people actually right. welcome you when you walk through the mm-hmm. door, but it's really stressful with the numbers. I spent, yeah. I spent 10 years doing it myself, and it's just it's quality of life mm-hmm. sometimes. Right. The they make you think like you're opening human heads. Right. It's like we're not Somebody's going to die if you mm-hmm. don't yeah. get them this wine. So when you go to a family winery over there, are you – is the conversation like we'll bring all of your products in or are you handpicking certain products that you want from each winery? That's the other thing that we do in our company is we don't overpromise. I mean, we, we tell them right from the get-go, we'll start off, we think we'll be successful for these one or two items and then we'll build upon that. We'll bring in another SKU after mm-hmm. we've had su- success with those two items, two or three items. And then we do a slow building process and we say that up front because... Um, 
what do they say? Overpromise and underdeliver. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So no under. under you you underpromise and overdeliver, over-deliver but you yeah. don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. Exactly. Correct. So yeah. yeah. Um, we try not to do that. And same with opening the other states. We don't go into other states unless we're firm in the states that we already are in. You yeah. Know, so you, you want to talk about that? What states you're in right now? So well, New York, New Jersey. We import and distribute ourselves. Um, we are in the process of possibly opening up Ohio, but we are in North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Mississippi, Florida, um, West Alabama. Virginia, yeah. we just opened, Alabama. Mm-hmm. And so East Coast. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We, <laughs> haven't cro- we, haven't cro- we haven't crossed the uh, Mississippi. Pennsylvania, yet. we included right. one. New Hampshire, we're trying for next. Carolinas. Did you yes. say? Yes. Yeah, yeah North and South. South. Mm-hmm. Is it difficult to get out west because of California and like the stranglehold they have over there? Or is it like, do mm. Californians just drink California wine? I don't know about California, but the mid, right. uh, like the the Midwest is, I think it's more of a logistics issue gotcha. yeah. and getting yeah. the product to them, not necessarily what they drink. Yeah, I can't, I can't yeah. speak uh, about the logistical mm-hmm. side of things, but I did live out west and just by the sheer. Uh, space and th- you're going to see more local stuff. Right. So, like for example, when I lived in Colorado, it's like every wine shop, unless they were a huge like big box store or something like that, their French and Italian and Spanish sections were tiny, because all right, what's all right? Then the, the wine's got to go from Spain or mm-hmm. from Italy, and it's got to make it to New York, more than likely, or it's going to come to Miami or so, or one of those ports. Yeah. Now it's going to cross all the way. So now it's on a truck or it's on a train car or whatever. Whereas, like, okay, I'll just get more California wine. It's it's right over the mountains. Sure. And it's right there. So it is it is more of a you know location. Mm-hmm. I and think. I think it's also that they want to support local. They feel yeah. the Californians feel that they uh, want to support their local people. Right. Sure. What's what's this first one that we're oh, oh. So in front bubbles. of us? Tis the bubble season. Mm. Um, so right now you have Ornella Milan My class Prosecco. Is empty. I'm gonna get more. <laughs> empty already? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so cheers. So it is Prosecco. So it's basically Italy's form of champagne, which they can't call champagne because they're not from the champagne region in France. Right. But the bubbles are light and flitty. This is a beautiful producer. Yeah. Um, well, we'll just keep it right here. Mm-hmm. So we can yeah, that's fine. Again, family. We'll around and talk about it. So Ornella Milan and Vigna Traverso. So it's a husband and wife team. The wife has Ornella Milan, and then the husband owns Vigna Traverso, which is up in Frioli. And they have three sons that also work on all the properties. And we always joke, be like, oh, that's a terrible family to be born into. <laughs> <laughs> Dad works at one, has one winery. But um, what I love about her wines is there's such class and finesse and elegance to her wines. So this, to me, is an above standard Prosecco. It's yeah, something really to be doubt. celebrated. And it's also very price conscious. Yeah, and oh, when I was, do, do you guys know ballpark that what it sold at Eddie's? Yes, twenty four ninety nine. Twenty four ninety nine. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. What I really love about this. So the other thing ab- about a lot of proseccos are going to be a little bit more um, mm-hmm. like demi sec. Okay, I like that. And <laughs> this one is a is a, a is a creamy. is a brute. So for your listeners out there, and even for you guys, if you don't know, like the classifications in terms of dryness and sweetness when it comes to sparkling wine, it's uh, dolce. Which is the sweetest? Then you have demi sec. Mm-hmm. Yes, demi sec, semi sweet. Then you have extra dry. This is going to be confusing. Extra dry is a, a, a step of above um, demi sec, and then brute is the most dry. Mm-hmm. You can. So it sounds weird. Like why isn't extra dry more dry? Right. Yeah. <laughs> really. But. So this being made in the brute style, it's it's not going to have any of that telltale sweetness that you may get mm-hmm. with some of the other uh, proseccos that are out there, which is what I love because when I was taking taking this around, to, uh, not only here but to other other clients, um, Jim and uh, Tyler, they were both saying they were like, "Wow, if you hadn't have told me that we were drinking prosecco, I'd swear that this is a champagne because it has that b- b- biscuity, yeasty sort of quality in terms of the mouth feel on it, and it's." Uh, I mean, our, if if they can see, there's really nice tight bubbles in this. Oh yeah, yeah, that's delicious, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yummy. Yeah, yes. yeah, and you can have that it's with nice just nice creaminess. About it's not overly yeast. It's, there's lively. Mm-hmm. It's just very lively. Now, for those that don't know, when would you have this? Before you eat a big meal, 
Um, After breakfast. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, with, <laughs> with breakfast. I, I, actually, on Sundays. Actually, yeah. for mimosas. I mean, it, it would be a great sure. blend into mimosa or bellini or even on its own. Yeah, your, I was going to say. Sunday brunch. But um, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that like, that's, I, there's, in my opinion, there's never a bad time for, for bubbles. I mean, they're, they're perfect any time. I mean, you could have this with any kind of shellfish. You could also just have it with a bunch of charcuterie. What's really funny is that there's some old school bar out in Los Angeles where they're famous for fried chicken. And they do, you get, it's, it's like $200, but you get their fried chicken and a bottle of Dom Perignon. And I have, I've tried various uh, food combinations and fried food and anything that has kind of heavy greasiness, sure. any kind of a dry sparkler really goes very well because it's going to cleanse your palate every time. Mm. And would not have thought of that. Yeah. And I've even, there was one time my wife and I, we, we paired a bottle of, uh, of uh, South African Prosecco with our steaks. So it was a rosé Prosecco, but regardless, mm-hmm. it, it all depends on what you're eating, what you like, and how, how you want to have those flavors mingle together. This is a really, but Prosecco is really versatile. Like you can use yes, it as an opener yes. for, um, for dinner. You can use it as people mingle around, as you mentioned, like charcuterie and appetizers, but you can also use it as a closer at the end of a meal. It'd be mm-hmm. great with cheeses and fruits and- Any kind of creamy crumb desserts, crumb cheesecake crumb yeah. or uh, fruit desserts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Like, or That's chocolate exciting. and strawberries. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Yeah. Bubbles, chocolate. There's a lot of Prosecco, I feel like, that comes from Italy. Do you ever see, like, the Italy classification of sparkling wine being its own thing? Because, like, you have Champagne. Obviously, it has to be from France, Champagne mm-hmm. region. W- right. Would you ever see some sort of regional thing come from somewhere else? Prosecco is. Oh, Prosecco is? Yeah. Prosecco is. I think... Prosecco is, but there are certain rules to Prosecco, and it's not necessarily the area, and there's a little bit... It, it is the varietal in terms of the grape. It's the, okay. it's the grape varietal that they use. So the Italians kind of make the rules as they go. Yeah, they're not as anal as the French. <laughs> yeah. The French are really insane. Sounds pretty so accurate. Some of it, like Brunello di Montalcino, that's, it has to be from the area, whereas right. Prosecco or Pinot Grigio, it has to be the grape in order for it to be the DOC. Gotcha. But it is a DOC, so it's, it's its own designation and recognized by the Italian law. And this one, I believe, is a DOC. Mm-hmm. If you look uh, oh, up is. on the neck, it you is. can see the, the tag. DOC on the back. Yes, and those those tags, those are uh, uh, a mark of quality and excellence. So mm-hmm. not everybody winds up getting those. To uh, co- to qualify oh. the winery, they would call up the and DOC is, is Department Origin Controlly. So they're like the government nerds. <laughs> All right, they're the ones <laughs> who control you know the standards of of what sure. you know, qualifies. So let's say for example the folks over at Ornella Malone, well, I'm sure what they wound up doing in order to get that tag is they called them up. Somebody came by some nerd with a clipboard and they went around and okay you're doing this oh no you're not doing that okay good you okay all right here and here you go so it's not like just anybody can get these tags so again and that is a mark hmm. of quality and excellence all of their SKUs have that tag yes no most of no. them it depending it depends on the variety okay. they do right. um their proseccos do yes and anything that's indigenous to the area that it's from mm-hmm. does but they also produce um, a wine called Eros, which is a Pinot Noir Malbec blend. Oh, it's so Those good. aren't recognized. That's not recognized by the DOC. No. So okay. it doesn't have their label. Um, but this is, speaking of DOC, so this is their Prosecco uh, Rosé. Mm-hmm. 2020 was the first time that Italian law, winemaking law, allowed Prosecco Rosé to be considered a DOC. Yeah. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. But the rules are, the laws, that it has to be 90% Glera grape, which mm. is a, the grape used in Prosecco, and 10% Pinot Nero. But they finally recognized it. Yeah. It's like That's the first cool. time That's in 100 amazing. years they actually wow. changed yeah. a DOC that, or added DOC. So when, oh, to add to it? Right. Wow. So when, um, when do they start making uh, Rosé Prosecco? Do you have any idea? Has it just oh, always like, been I mean, a thing? Like when in history? Yeah. That's an excellent question. I do not know. No. Okay, I know sorry. it officially became recognized in 2020. I don't right, know right. when they started making it. Mm. No problem. Yeah, because I've never heard of it before. I just know of this, mm-hmm. this stuff. Yeah. So is that a brute too, or is that? Correct. Okay, correct. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is exciting. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm going to try not to pop you in the face. Oh, yeah, right. okay. Just you wouldn't be the first, shatter some glass. You wouldn't be the first woman to hit Anybody me. listening, <laughs> no, no make more. sure you yeah. cover your hand over the cork. Yeah. <laughs> or unless you don't like the person, then let it fly. 
Love it. It's a great sound, isn't it? It is. That's so it exciting. Is. It's like when you pop, you know, you, you open a fresh bottle of whiskey and you hear that. Yep. Oh, yeah. And then the very first glug. We get very <laughs> excited over that. Oh, my God. Yeah, we get very excited. I just yeah. noticed the tones and your voices just change. You guys were like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we're simple creatures. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's obvious that, you know, these guys find uh, good wine, good spirits uh, to be kind of sexy, which is Absolutely. so true. I mean, there have definitely been wines before where I'm just like, wow, this is, oh, thank you. it's just so sexy. It's fascinating, you know? too, because of someone's progression into wine. Uh -huh. Like, you, you start with kind of church wine. You have no idea what's happening, but right. you're like seven. And you're like, whatever, <laughs> I'll just drink it, right? And then, sure. and then your family's telling you, this is actually terrible. Like, right. this is not good at all to drink. Right. And then you grow up, and then you go to college, and you have Franzia. Yes. And then once you get through the box wine phase, the white Zinfandel. Yes. Oh, yeah. Then you, then you start realizing like, oh, I can have um, like jelly grapes in wine. Like that's <laughs> exciting. And yeah. then you pound those. Mm -hmm. and then you you get past the headaches. Yeah. And then you're like, how how can I work my way to drier and drier and drier? Then you taste mm -hmm. a dry red for the first time, and it's all pepper. And you're yeah. totally thrown off. And right. you're like, why? Or it's why really, is this a thing? Yeah. Why is my tongue sticking oh. to the roof of my mouth? Right. And I don't and like this. How come, oh. There's something coating on my gums right now. And yeah. You just want to scrape it. Exactly. Yeah. Why do I wake up at three and need a lot of water? And then all of a sudden, you you finally work your way to enjoying all the different kinds. And mm -hmm. then then you make the decision between being a red and a white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's your go to? That's like true. for me, white gives me headaches, so oh, I'm, really? a, I'm a red guy. Okay, huh. but but I, I I just deal with Drink it. Anything. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Right. Like yeah. I'm still Irish. Like I yeah. can't be that rude. <laughs> no. So wh what was that process for you guys? Because obviously this is a this is a major career decision to yes. make in your lives. Like yeah. how did how did you guys come to that decision and saying you know what this is it. I wish it were something fancy. I was a bartender. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I have to, in it's the restaurant same business. thing. I grew up in the restaurant industry, so. Yeah. And yeah. so and I was offered the opportunity to sell to sell the wine oh, and I man. said sure. And then then I started learning about the wine. And that's when mm. I went through besides the college phase with the white Zinfandel <laughs> and the box <laughs> in the fridge. But um, it was Riesling to Chardonnay. It's kind of like any other alcohol that you drink. Right. Like, um, so you go Riesling, Chardonnay, or Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, and then you start getting deeper, deeper. And then you go right. into the Pinot Noir, and the Pinot Noir is kind of the segue from the white to the red. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the Merlot. Mine was Merlot. Mine was Merlot because it's well, just, fancy. It's kind of, it's, well, that's what my mother liked. So <laughs> that's when she was going to drink red, but she was a dyed in the wool white Zen kind of lady. Interesting. Um, and yes, just like with Kat, I mean, I started off in the restaurant business since I was 16 years old. And then, but I found out very quickly, like, wow, if I know more about this stuff, my check average is going to be higher. So, and then I'm going to get a bigger tip. So I started to sort of ask anybody and everybody from bartenders to, you know, the, the, the old experienced guys who waited tables for, you know, 30, 40 mm -hmm. years and stuff like that. And then the other thing that was great is when you would get those reps who would come in, who would want to educate the staff on what the restaurants just bought. So I actually do have this one little nerd story if I can, you know, tell sure, you guys real absolutely. quick. What really solidified it for me, there was this restaurant, doesn't exist anymore here in Buffalo, but it was in the old Radisson Hotel across the street from the Niagara, from the airport. Okay, it was uh, Pranzo, Pranzo Ristorante. So if anybody out there is my age and they remember this, um, th this was one of the nice fine dining restaurants. We were revamping the entire wine list and it was, 99 and we had brought on so we're going through and we get to a 1997 clo pigas meritage oh, yeah. yeah and see and, and this, so this is a california producer and a meritage uh, those are classic uh, like bordeaux style blends uh meritage is a a term that the californians came up with to compete with hmm. the french specifically with bordeaux i have great varietal blends yeah and they're, they're classics, a uh, blend of Cab Merlot, maybe a little Melbeck, some maybe Cab Franc. Cab and Franc, Petit yeah. Syrah. Mm -hmm. Petit Syrah, exactly. And I, it, was, it was transformative. It really was. <laughs> it, I can't, I can't <laughs> say it any other way other than, oh, my God, that was the light bulb moment, like, you know, hit me over the head kind of thing. And then I really got into it and really got into it. But unfortunately, I didn't get into the selling side of it for a number of years. Mostly because I was just having too much fun. Right. <laughs> I mean, fair. waiting tables and working in a restaurant. I mean, it, it, I don't know how it is now because I haven't been, I haven't done it in over ten years. But I mean, back then it was, you know, it was great. Hedonism. Sure. Yeah, 
Right, and I was in my twenties. So, uh, and then I got an opportunity to uh, work in retail, and that's its own grind. Uh, as fun as that is, mm-hmm. um, you're, that, that's another thing, is you're constantly bombarded with information. You've got so many reps who are coming in with so many wines that they're trying to, to sell you, and they're going to sit there, and they're just going to keep pouring, and they're going to, and as long as you keep asking questions, they're going to stick around. Sure. Mm-hmm. So um, it turned into one of those things where it was like, well, I think I want to do what they do, and you know, the rest is history. Isn't it crazy how it's a full industry to just dive into? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. It's kind yeah. of cool. Yeah. yeah. It is really, really cool. And when you say about like their aha moments, like how we got into this, there are those aha moments. Sure. If you'll notice, everybody, like some people, if they're starting out with wine, they just don't get it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't get it. Yeah. What do you mean by, what do you mean by red berries and blackberries mm-hmm. and patrol? And yeah. And, and what do you mean mushrooms? Grass I don't taste mushrooms. and barnyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there are those barnyard aha the moments. If people, if you take the time and actually, um, I think I had two aha moments with wine and food and how they connect. And that was like, aha. The first time was how they don't work well together. <laughs> I was at a, I was doing a wine dinner and somebody paired a Shiraz with a cream of asparagus cinnamon Ew. soup. And yeah. that was my first aha. These don't work well together. And I see how food interacts with wine. Was that the purpose? Was that... They don't work well, or were no, they trying they, to pair it? they were it? trying to pair it, oh boy, so yeah. it did work well. <laughs> right. So you took this beautiful Shiraz, and then all of a sudden, and you took it, you had some soup, and then you yeah. took the Shiraz again, and it was just like sandpaper. What? I mean, there was no fruit oh, whatsoever. God. So then you're like, aha, this is this is what they mean about <laughs> food and wine. Yeah. And then there are the times when you take, say, a Spanish wine, and you put it with a cured meat or yeah. a cheese I bear that, ham, that goes well with, know. and you're like, aha, yeah. this mm. is what they mean by food and wine right. going together. So that's, that kind of keeps you in the industry. That's a really interesting story because I've never heard of somebody experiencing a tasting and really being put off by the fact that it didn't go well together Isn't because they actually don't. Sometimes like when <clears> – <throat> this is my favorite topic because when you, when you pair alcohol with food, mm-hmm. everybody thinks, oh, like everything just goes together anyway. But no, you actually no. had the reverse experience where right. this doesn't go together, and this is why people like us exist yeah. to make these experiences go together. Right. That's fascinating. Right. Yeah. And it's sad because a lot of people have those bad experiences, and they blame the wine. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't blame oh, that's the, 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 the comparison together. So Now, because you've had all those experiences, and now you're meeting with family wineries, mm-hmm you're able to pick up way more than the average person, Mm -hmm. which is fantastic, right? That's Mm -hmm. also why you're in the positions you guys are in. So what is that conversation like with those local wineries other than we want to have you guys in the States? Like, are you diving into, if you can pick up tannins, what their dirt composition are? Like, are you diving into the weeds with them about all that kind of stuff? And that's Mm -hmm. why you're hand selecting one to three SKUs up front because you think that will fit based on the research that you've done back here? Yes. That's awesome. I, I hate, I hate that. It's such a simple answer, <laughs> mm-hmm. but no, yes, yes. You base it okay. on, yeah, you base it on all those things. And, mm-hmm. and you base it, is, uh, the other thing is, is there a hole in our portfolio that this will fill? This right. will fit a certain category that we don't have mm-hmm. and we have a need for, so. Like what though? Like what category would having a wine from Spain in this specific region because we don't have that kind of dirt? Right. And is that what it is? Like you're just identifying those deficiencies? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And From the territory. Yeah, exactly. What the market is looking for, you know. So perfectly. Uh, so how do you how do you know the market's looking for it? Uh, sometimes you can tell just just by looking looking what is on the racks, or even more importantly, what's not mm, on the racks. Sure. You know. That's a good point. I don't know the way we the way the way Mark and I do it right. is um, he he wants a well rounded portfolio. He wants things from areas. He wants the wines that are from the areas they're supposed to be from. Mm. So Tempranillo from Ribera del Duero, that's what, it's, that's what it's known for. So we want a Tempranillo from that area and that speaks of the soil and the sun and the composition and, every, and the terroir that's involved with it. So that's why we have Calejo because they, to us, are a perfect representation of that territory and that area. Mm-hmm. Ornella, uh, Ornella Milan Prosecco. Um, to me, she's a fabulous representation of Prosecco from the Veneto area. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what we look for in filling the portfolio. And marketing, it's hard to stay, it's hard to be with the trends and stay ahead of the mm-hmm. trends and yeah. catch up to the trends. So I don't know if we necessarily go with trends, but you will notice 
as he was saying, certain times sales pick up in certain areas and dip down other than just the seasonal aspect of things. You mentioned Greece earlier, but it's tough to have a lot of like country specific wines that aren't the staples. Exactly. So what is it like to work with the Greeks? And, and trying to we get don't. you don't no we don't <laughs> no. No. I, I mean I was no. only, I was only bringing that up because uh, th- there's so many because people only think of European wine as being French Italian Spanish mm-hmm. German the origins of right like the, the big five but I mean there are countries like Croatia Slovenia you know uh, Georgia in in Russia uh, all you have to do is is really like look at a map and you can see in the same thing like those growing regions and it's got to be like a hot area. Israel makes great wine. Lebanon makes great wine. Mm. Um, the, the those are just, yeah. No, 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 go. No, no, no. Those, those are just categories that we don't look we don't, at. Because, and we don't because have. Because when he says about demand, uh, yeah. we, I mean, there is a demand, but just not the people that, not the people we do business with are right. demanding it. Yeah. Understood. But when you say about Greek, you mean what is it like to work with the Italians versus the Spaniards versus the French? Yeah, we can go down that, r- that route. It was just, it was a question just from experience where there's, I'm not, I'm not really trying to like say this in this light, but <laughs> Addis has a ridiculous wine selection and we were on the honeymoon and I texted Tyler and not to sound pretentious, but I had an international oh, cell phone yeah. service plan. <laughs> yeah. but it, uh, WhatsApp? Is that it? No, no I, I just texted him and I was just like, hey, do you have this winery in your store? Mm-hmm. And it was it was a, a winery located in, in, in Santorini. And oh, okay. he goes, we can we have a couple SKUs. And that's about it, though. And I said, okay, what about boom, 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 boom? And I was texting him because I had the list in front of me because okay. I'm at the winery. Right. And he goes, yeah, I have like A, B, and C. He's like, but I can get those through through like the, the network or whatever. Which was fascinating because I'm like, who the hell, like, right. how does that even work? And right. that's that's what triggers like my curiosity, and that's why we like having you guys on because yeah. we can ask those kind of questions, like, how does it actually work? Like, if I, for some odd reason, let's just say I find myself in that country, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, this was super good. Mm-hmm. I also know the label is going to be different because I'm here. Right. It's gonna, you know, it's not going to be the same as back home. So I need the name specific to right. make sure that it's the same wine. Right. And it could potentially taste different because it's not going to be. He, like this is transported 100 percent exactly. transported yeah. across yeah. the atlantic mm-hmm. so like how does that whole thing work so that's what just triggered that question in my head to you guys of like how does one to your point yes how does it work between spain and italy and what that conversation's like differing there but then secondly um do people reach out to you guys and just say could you potentially get this country inside of your portfolio I don't want to open it up and be like, yes, we can. And then all of a sudden everybody's like, by Vino Selections, what right. did they said they would bring this in? But um, yeah, I mean, there there are times, if you do your research, if you would call us up and say, I'm at a winery right now, this is their name, they don't have an importer into the U.S., would you consider them? We would say, absolutely, okay. we would consider them. Give us their contact information, we'll reach out, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So that's that would be the start of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and... There, there have been times where Mark, somebody was traveling abroad, um, this woman, Peggy, who works in our office, her son was in the military and he went to this place in Germany and brought him some wines from Germany and she gave him a bottle for Christmas and Mark loved it so much that he literally Googled, found a contact information, reached out to the man, needed to get a translator because the man didn't speak German oh, yeah, and we're now importing his wines, yeah, the Anton, Anton Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Yeah, so it's Was just it Vilsack or Grafenvier? No. Okay. <laughs> that was Gryffindor. Gryffindor. Yeah. There's, there are two of the major bases in Germany, and they have really good wine oh, in Germany. Oh, where he? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. that's why I asked. Uh, were you in the military? Yeah, but there's, oh. there's super good wine oh, in Germany. Okay, thank you. So that was oh my shut up there. German, German wines are... <laughs> That was one of my questions Delicious. later. If you okay. guys, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't no, want to no. like just rattle off like specific countries live, but I was, well, not live. I don't want to yeah. stress you guys out. Yeah, but like, now we no, can't no, square. Well, I know, I know. <laughs> while recording, I just I don't didn't want to. I think we could square. <laughs> <laughs> you could. But, um, but yeah, yeah, so, okay. So you guys do have German wines. That's, oh, yes. that's yes. really cool. And that's actually something we seek out intentionally because of the ageability and because, I mean, German wines are kind of the unsung hero. Yeah. The hidden which, gem, yeah, which is really crazy. Are. When you look at latitude and longitude, not to be a super nerd, no. But when you nerd look at out, that, man. our climate's very similar to Germany's. It is, and that's, that's what's why really New York cool. State 
uh, yes. Riesling is, is so good. Yes. Yeah. And you can kind of match that and be like, what is our market like? And yeah. then what, what if we put a different flag on that? Yeah. You know, just sprinkle on a different <laughs> flag and all of a sudden it's just like, oh, wow. Yeah. It's like these people got the goods, especially no, in Buffalo. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny. I, I, use, I use that story all the time with uh, the Anton Zimmerman and the fact that the gentleman does not speak English and that we have to call somebody in Austria. In Austria. And then that, that the Austrian person calls <laughs> calls the, the Zimmerman people and they do a three-way call. So oh, I, wow. and I, cause cool. I just think it's hilarious. The yeah, person in know? Austria is probably like, like, damn it, these people are Right, calling. again, <laughs> like, oh, God, <laughs> damn Americans. He gets, a, he, gets a, he gets a translation yeah. fee. It's like, it's not that hard. Just, just <laughs> learn the language. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. So and that's, and that's another thing that's shocking is because you hear mm-hmm. like, uh, particularly with Germans, uh, you know, knowing knowing english mm-hmm. it's almost like out of spite <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this right. guy decided not no no i will only speak the mother language <laughs> that is all yeah. <laughs> so absolutely yeah I feel like we're walking a thin line right now no, <laughs> no it's okay again they can fix it in post <laughs> <laughs> so when you're talking about wine there's a certain like i don't want to say pretentiousness but there's this aura of elegance i guess associated with wine and it, the the topic of sommeliers get brought up a lot. Are you guys sommeliers or are you planning I am, on I am not. I do plan uh, eventually to get uh, not my SOM certification because that is to, to, to be a sommelier that, that's really much more geared towards the restaurant industry. Yeah, hospitality. Right? It's, it's very, yeah, it's, it's very hospitality and, and restaurant oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go for my W set, which is that re- you want to talk about nerdy. That'll really get into the weeds where you have to like – know about soil composition and you know all all of those things it's it's a, it's a lot more technical what is it stand for um world spirits no it's it wine is wine i don't can't help i me hear out. it all the time i just don't yeah it's study. one of those things I, I, like, I can appreciate a lot of people doing it because it's a lot of work yeah, yeah. and it's definitely I wish I, you have to have yeah. a passion behind it oh my goodness do you we yeah. were talking to jim yeah. about it here and he's just like yeah. there's there's people that are like really high up in the psalm levels right yes and they'll taste it blind no yeah. idea what the bottle right. is no idea what the label is and they're just like oh <laughs> yeah. it's this region and it's, it's this dirt time. composition right. i'm just like what what in the world <laughs> and you you literally realize like oh i just straight up don't have the genetic palette right like right. behind me mm. to figure that out when somebody else does and we've had that realization with whiskey uh-huh. where someone has a, such a different palette where their nose picks it up more their tongue picks it up more and i'm like what what yeah. do you eat i don't have to the learn focus. that like I can't 100%. focus that long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, then you have to know everything. I'm yeah. like, that's yeah. that's too much. It's intense. Well, yeah. I do know one person. I don't know if he's still in the business, but he had a leg up on everybody because he's a super taster. So, mm-hmm. and if you're familiar with what a super taster is, is they actually have uh, twice as many taste buds like on their tongue and in their mouth that normal people do. Mm-hmm. So everything is dialed up to eleven for oh, them. Oh, this is legit. Like yeah, he has no, no, more no. taste buds yes. in his mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's he, what I'm saying. It's yeah, like you fair. can't. No, I, well, I agree. Right. No, but you, you, we get revenge because he he's he can't eat anything spicy because oh, it yeah, just true. it just destroys him. He's like he's got to have his wings plain, you know. Oh, no, nerd. no hot sauce. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no hot sauce on his tacos. You know, what's the point of living then? Well, uh, he, he can <laughs> taste all this stuff it's blind, true. and he knows what the soil is. <laughs> so you guys are into whiskey and bourbon, into yeah. the brown spirits. Yeah. Now, do you do studying? Do you go through courses, or do you just do it basically? I I, I feel that a lot of learning is done through experience. It yeah. is so. Yes, we're. And we're, there's an inside chuckle here. It is. It, <laughs> it is because nervous. we we don't really. It's just funny for because us. like certifications and everything like that. I feel like people in our industry, wine and whiskey, use it as like, I'm better than everybody. And like, this uh, whiskey sucks because I'm certified. And it's just like, no, it's just for different people. Right. And that's kind of where we joke around because, yes, we are certified bourbon stewards out of Moonshine University in Kentucky. <laughs> but we use that to just to give credibility to our ratings to be like, we're not just two people that don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we're also the same people that are like, Drink it with ice, man. I don't care. Do whatever mm-hmm. you want. Yeah. Sure. So sure. I'm sure that that has to exist. I don't know if you were going to add anything else to that because you got super juice when she brought that up. No, it's because I knew <laughs> I knew that that was like the inside joke between us. Yeah. Because right. most like we don't we don't really promote it that much. But like we yes, like we've been hired for whiskey tastings and things like that. But it's it really like you to your point. It's it's self education mm-hmm. with yeah. a little bit of formal education behind right. it. Yeah. But in reality, we've just tried over 200 different spirits mm-hmm. right. and we've worked up to what we're able to taste now. But we also eat random things right. just to kind of build that palate. And right. the, the the actual inside joke is like, go to a grocery store, pick up fruit, and smell it. Yeah, 
yeah. then you're going to build a, a totally different pallet. And I was like, that's, this is what all the experts are saying to do. And yeah. if I get made fun of, you know, not no free shout outs and weak mons, yeah. like I'll do that. Like I'll just, <laughs> I'll pick up a dragon fruit if I can find one. Uh-huh. And that is also why traveling is massive. That's also why I asked if either of you travel, yeah. because you're going to do things and have things in different mm-hmm. countries that are totally going to relate to your whole right. portfolio, right. because you're going to have, obviously European food is so much cleaner than ours. Yeah. Yes. So when you have that experience and you're understanding that and There's, you can articulate that to people back here that haven't traveled across right. the ocean, it's just changing the entire dynamic of the conversation. Right. Yes. And yeah, it's just, it's exciting. But we, we love spirits. Yeah. I am a certified beverage professional, by the way. Ooh. Oh, there you go. Look at that. You like that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that it. sounded big. Just I drink it, a lot. Just it out there. <laughs> so so but what, I am actually certified. So what made you get that? Um, was it because of this business? It, yes. Yes and no. It was. I had to with my with my last job. Mm. We had to go through testing, and it was basically from the ground up. I mean, you learned everything about the grape to the vine mm-hmm. to the soil to same with same with the spirits end of it. I don't know if I've retained any of it, Thank you. but. Uh, same with spirits and and the process and how it goes from grain to alcohol or so mm-hmm. yeah I mean it's pretty intense it's and y- it has a tendency you can get into that overkill point where you you're so, you're thinking so much about the education part of it that yeah. you're not really you're not focused into the present of what's going on in front yeah, of you yeah that's a really good point because we not to give him a shout out to a, a business that's not here but Clonakilty is an Irish distillery and the guy here right. was just like. Don't even worry about the mash bill. Just drink the juice. It's good. Yeah. And like, that's what we resonate with. It's just like, just enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and that correlates with both wine and spirits, because yeah. for us, obvi- like the bourbon market's massive in the U.S. for mm-hmm. obvious reasons, right? Sure. At the end of the day, though, it has to be, by law, it has to be a specific mash bill. In this right. case, it's corn heavy. Right. 51%. E- yeah. And eventually you get to a point where you've had so many different bourbons mm-hmm. and so many different ryes. You're just like, okay. It's, it's baking spice, it's vanilla, it's honey, yeah. it's from this state. Like, I get it. Then you have Irish whiskey or you have scotch. scotch. And then you're f- you're finding out, like, there's a difference that you can visit, like, you can actually taste between malted barley and corn. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then uh, just just regular barley. And you're just like, this is now my favorite grain because it tastes yeah. so much like, different. Wow. It's fresh. Right. It's pure. Like, there's just so many intricacies with it. Now, with wine, I love reds. Mm-hmm. There is no shot that I'm remotely close between wine and bourbon. Like I'm much, much better or whiskey in general. I'm much better with whiskey because I have way more time under mm-hmm. my belt with whiskey mm-hmm. than right. wine. You guys, I feel like are opposite, which is great. So uh-huh. what do you taste I out a lot of, of whiskey? <laughs> my man. So, so what do you guys taste in like for this one, for example, like what do you taste in this? Yeah, like because for red wine is, for me, instead of it being for whiskey, is like vanilla caramel. For red wine, I'm just always like plum and cranberries. And like, uh-huh. I know that that's probably surface level. Really? But I like, get, what I do get you grapes. guys? It's true. It. It's, hard. it's hard to get away from that grape thing. Once you have that grape in your head. I'll tell you what is a really good tool. I don't know if you guys use it, but the aroma wheel. Yes, I was just like going to say that. The aroma wheel. Getting into it, I was always like, I don't get it. All I get is right. I get grapes. Mm-hmm. I don't get what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, uh-huh with all the adjectives but an aroma wheel is it has the aromas both good and bad right and for some reason when you have something tangible in front of you and you taste the wine and you look at that aroma wheel you're like oh this is what i'm getting mm. for some it, it just again it's another aha moment it's that the same it, with it whiskey kind of clicks. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so um this i get a lot of spice Speaking i get of i get leather that's one of my big things that oh, i yeah. always get from mm-hmm. uh from tempranillo Particularly ones that are uh, in the the Ribera del Duero region. Yeah. So can um, we talk about this wine quick before we get yeah. really deep into the tasting notes? Sure. L- look at the legs, Derek. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so sexy. So this is the, I actually Cat would probably know a heck of a lot more about this one. Okay. So this is this is, again is a funny story about Mark traveling abroad. So he was on a trip with another with an importer, and they were in Spain, and they were actually visiting other wineries, and they had about an, they had an afternoon to kill. And so they were driving by and saw this winery. There's actually more to the story than that. But anyway, <laughs> the woman invited them into the winery and went through the tasting with the wines. Again, he was kind of on his own. It wasn't it wasn't business. And then when he started his own distributor, it was like, I want this wine and yeah. Playho. So it's a it's a mm. third generation <coughs> family um, that started. They started with the um, with the vineyards, and they would they basically would sell off the grapes. Um, and then the their father actually started producing the wine, and it's strictly Tempranillo at the time. And the, 
they have different levels of Tempranillo depending on where they come from the vineyards and the sunlight and the slopes. Um, now the three daughters and the son have taken over the winery and this is their entry level. So this is Flores de Calejo. So um, flowers of Calejo. So this is the one that spent six months in French oak. Mm. 100% Tempranillo, and then, um, like I said, the next level is they have a Crianza, which is delicious, and then they have a Grand Crianza, and then they have, uh, excuse me, a Grand Calejo, and then they have Majuelos, and then they have Felix, which is their top of the tier. we have Felix, I know that. Yeah, that's yeah. their top of the tier, and mm. that's dedication to their father. But it's all right. Tempranillo, just done different aging and different oak barrels. So is this technically just a red blend? No. This is typically just a red grape, one one grape. Okay. Tempranillo. One variety. Tempranillo. Tempranillo, Tempranillo is, is Tempranillo. more or less, for just to, to, to break it down in layman's terms, it's more or less like the national grape of, of Spain. Oh, they okay. produce they produce other varietals, you know, Syrah and Cab and things like that. But Tempranillo is 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 the, mm. the major Rioja grape. Rioja and, and Ribera del Duero, right. the regions in Spain, are known for their, for their Tempranillos. Tempranillos. Understood. So just like Cattaraugus County is known for Walter's grapes. Yeah. Right. Kind of, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then, so, so as I'm learning this, you, in my mind, it's Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. is that basically just like there's Pinot Noir, there's Cab Sauvs, there's Red Blends, there's Molos, there's Cabs, and then there's this? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, for some reason, it jumps out in my mind that the Tempranillo is the equivalent of Zinfandel. So if yeah. there's there's like a yes. But so you're but uh, if I can just interrupt for just a second. But what you're saying is that it's its own grape, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah. so if I'm yes. on a, if I'm looking on a shelf, it's right. just like these are the Pinot Noirs. It's like yeah. this is a right. Tempranillo. I'm like oh damn. But I'm grab this because I know the grape. But <laughs> <laughs> but nobody knows the grape, so it'll probably be fun. you'll find it in Spain. You'd find it in Spain. So. That's exactly it. You'll find it in the Spanish. Nobody category. breaks it down that way. Nobody yeah, not a lot not of here. People, no, like, just no, like no, you no. said, not a lot of people are familiar with the Tempranillo grape. So what they do is they'll market it as a Spanish red. Exactly. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, uneducated Americans over here. Well, <laughs> no. I mean, that's so. But that's, that's <laughs> there's the, so many different grape varieties. And right. that's that's the thing how how Don't uh, dumb them down. America <laughs> tried to separate itself and be its own animal in the wine world was all right we're going to market like our wine for example mm-hmm. like let, let's take the legend uh, robert mondavi i mean he marketed as this is my cabernet it's cabernet you know as opposed to the, the next wine that we'll be tasting which is bordeaux which you know if you know, mm-hmm. listeners people who don't know it has to be at least two grapes now we'll and confuse it can, the hell and out it can of be you. any or it can be a, as, as many as five um, of so, certain grapes. Of certain grapes. Then they have to be those grapes. But when it comes to if you're a wine shop, you're, you, you don't want to overwhelm your uh, customers with too much information. It, it, to make a whiskey analogy, it's like you're not going to break down bottles from which part of bourbon right. county. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Where, yeah, it's all from, it's all bourbon. It's all Kentucky. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. exactly. So hmm. uh, that's, that's, that's why they do it. Like you go to the Italian section if you want a, a Tempranillo, excuse me, uh, a, a Chianti. Now you're really confusing. Yeah, you go to, when you go to Spain. And Chianti is an actual region. It's not a grape. That was right. a, another thing I learned. First thing I learned getting into the wine industry. I right. always thought a Chianti was the grape. I feel like that's the challenging part Sorry. of wine no, 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 is because no, please, let's there's just different talk. classifications of wine based off of either your region or your grape. Right. And I feel like that confuses a lot of people, like Chianti, like you're saying, versus... Prosecco. Prosecco. Right. Yeah, it's just, it's a very different dynamic when you talk about wine that doesn't exist in other beverage worlds. So I think that that was also the success of the U.S. Well, oh oh no, go go ahead. Well, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, the, 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 the Scottish... They've gotten their whiskey like it's very different in Isle from right. Campbelltown to the Highlands to the Lowlands. It's all still whiskey, yeah. but very, very different in terms of styles. So, like that's how the French are. Like, there is no way you're going to mistake a Burgundy for something from the co- from the, the Rhone region. All right, and mm. you're never going to mistake a Chablis for a, a you know a white Bordeaux. Uh, so. Uh, it, yeah. and, and those are all different grapes, and that's the same one that again with Scotch whiskey. It's all different styles. I mean, I can't I can't drink Isle because it's like an a, licking an ashtray and sucking on a band aid. It's Whiskey, terrible. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I love it. I, iodine <laughs> and iodine and cow yeah. shit. So I just hate it. <laughs> it is. It's terrible. 
yeah. but it's mother that's Earth. That, that, that so that's how europe is when it comes to like they break everything down mm-hmm. by regions you know oh, that's like, i don't know that. No, see th- th- yes yeah it, no, know, it just it, it gets very unless you it's very confusing to the average consumer right. because there are different laws and rules and regulations That's for each country. Thing, yeah. France is considered the mother of all winemaking laws. Like they are the golden rule, and all the other countries have followed some kind of suit that is Similar. within mm-hmm. similar. But a little bit looser. Mm-hmm. They, they kind of got a lot, a little bit looser as they went down. So Italy also follows the, the AOC, which is the French, and the um, Italian has the AO, DOC, mm-hmm. um, and then Spain has their also their own to follow. Um, so it's very confusing unless you know each country's rules to actually read the label. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I say about Chianti. I always a lot of people think Chianti is the grape, right? But Italy is also about the region sometimes yeah right see and that's what i was getting at is if i i think of chianti and riesling is the same classification but it's not because chianti is the region riesling's the grape correct right so that that's where i get confused with right like i mean sometimes the italians we make our own laws you know pinot grigio (laughs) pinot grigio but (laughs) you don't mess with bernardo you know (laughs) no that's very true (laughs) <laughs> um, but France is very strict, and what he—I think what he's saying is, um, as far as Bordeaux is concerned, there are only five grapes that you can use. And as far as Burgundy is concerned, you can only use these Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in order to be called Burgundy from that region. So that's mm. where, um, unless you know those rules, you don't really know. What would you compare this to, like out of the big name uh, types of wines? Would you say this is more like a Pinot Noir? Would no. you say this is more like a Merlot? Or no. what, could you nothing compare no. it to anything? Well, I, I, I think hard. if you do that, you're taking away from the beauty of, of the Tempranillo grape. Sure. Because uh, this is this is unique, man. Like yeah, this, right. It's, 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 it's like very full body, but it's also thin. Like you're not, it's not overwhelming. And it you. comes sleek, at you really. Right. It's a very sleek wine. It comes at you really dry at the end, but then yeah. softens out to be super sweet at the end. Yeah, it makes yes. no it's sense. It's very strange. Yeah, it yeah. makes yeah. no yeah. sense. It's yeah. delicious. So, and right. again, that comes with the region and the area that it's from. Because you'll find other Tempranillos from Spain, they're like. Yeah. Or they're just really rust. Is, is another yard. way to put it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what would you pair this with? Just a meat? Meats, cheeses, yeah. cured meats, sausages. I'd have. Uh, do you know pricing? Cheeses. Yeah, uh, they have it here for twenty four ninety nine. Man, wow. this yeah. is really a good, good. Really cool. And it's yeah. 2016, which is right. really cool. And that's the other thing about a lot of the European wines is the ageability. Mm-hmm. We were yeah. talking about Germany, the Rieslings that they produce. I mean, the Rieslings, the 15-year-old Rieslings are the best. Yeah. I 15, mean, they 20 do some really old. good, like today's kind of Rieslings, but the, uh, they're really spectacular 15, 20 years from One now. of the crazy, you would appreciate this. One of the craziest things about Germany is they have family ran, similar to wineries, mm-hmm. but they have family owned operated breweries that are also like hotels. Nice. And really? they're like nine generations deep. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, we opened in like 24 AD. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's astounding. And you yeah. drink Here, their I beer. Have a wine 24 yeah. AD. Right. Yeah. And you drink the beer and you're like, this is really good beer. They're like, we know. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then we you know. <laughs> then you try their wines and you're Thank like, you. this is better than the beer. They're like, we know. Right. It's like, what is going on? Like, Duh. how could, yeah. Like, how come everything you guys have here is amazing? Well, uh, there's the old saying of, uh, Americans think 200 years is a long time, and Fair. then Europeans think that 200 miles is a long distance. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's the funny thing. Again, uh, having some of these folks from uh, Italy, from Spain, who have come over, who I've worked with, mm-hmm. and uh, there are some stretches, not so much here in Western New York. I mean, big deal. I'm like, they get in the car. I'm like, oh yeah, we got to go to Rochester today. But when they go down south, particularly whether it's uh, you know Alabama or Mississippi. And these guys have told stories who they're working with our guys down there. And they're just like, we were in the car for four <laughs> hours. And I, they were like, we didn't realize your country was this big. And I was like, that was just one state. You know? <laughs> we don't yeah. realize how big our country is. Right, right, unless you actually drive it. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's, that, that's another thing is they know everything in terms of like what's in their backyard, what's in their neighbor's mm-hmm. backyard when it comes to wine. So they're going to know. Like, all right, this, all right, I know this slope. I know that there's mm. a river that's over this hill, and that river starts here, 
and it carries this amount of, of soil and sediment mm-hmm. and things like that. And um, the, the thing that really is messing with Europe right now is the same thing that's happening like out west with you know, and I don't want to get crazy. Here, I was just about to bring it up. Climate with change. Climate change. I said, believe it or yeah. not, it's, I mean, you it's, can't ignore it. No. It's, I mean, it's, it's and they're, I really mean, Bordeaux burned this, this past summer. I mean, they had bad fires and a lot of Italy, uh, a lot, large portions of Italy was just like praying for rain. Champagne is actually starting to produce in United Kingdoms. Yeah. So the, a lot of the champagne houses in France have actually started purchasing mm. property and producing grapes over wow. in uh, England. Which so can they still call it champagne considered. then? They're trying to go Change through laws. some laws. Because it's a French owned one. from Champagne region, but they're. Uh, right. Okay. Well, they're tra- they're trying you. to work around that. The English so, are getting the last laugh. Uh, and I always joke. I'm like, you know, Pitts- I'm from Pittsburgh. So I'm like, yeah. Pittsburgh's going to be beachfront property yeah. in like 10 <laughs> right, years. Right, I'm right. so excited. But New York can actually be an upcoming winemaking region. Exactly. I mean, they're I mean, strong one, right now. One day we'll make But they might be the new California. And I feel like a lot of. People from California are going to hate me for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> because right but now, I mean, our region is similar to Germany, right? And yes. then New- Long Island is what. What's Long Island similar to? Because that's different. So right? you're going to go, if you're going to go a little further south, then uh, I would say. I mean, like what? Czech Republic, Hungary? Maybe even for Long south Island? Of France. Yeah, maybe. Sure. Or, or oh. central France. Uh, that's so fascinating. I would to say, me. yeah, I would say yeah. more central France. Yeah. Probably. So what's this one that we just poured right now? Okay, so now we're on to France. Speaking yes. of. Gotcha. So this is Bordeaux. So How do you sh- pronounce this? Chateau Haute Bézac. Chateau Haute Bézac. Chateau, 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 Chateau Bézac. Bézac. Yes. Coup bourgeois. It's a 2016. Yes. 2016. Got a 92 points. Great there you year. go. Good seller. That, that's yes. marketing. That's marketing. <laughs> no, so listen. <laughs> I know. So th- <laughs> we were talking about this earlier. <laughs> so there is a discrepancy as far as people ask about the ratings. You know somebody else thought that this wine was really good. So, th- no matter what you so feel got about where the population, yeah. the publication, you guys rate things, don't you? We do. Sure do. Yeah. Right. Plus, plus. Do you, do you, all right. So, do you use a like a one to ten? No. Or no. No. So back Five in stars. college, back in college, we had this professor that was on painkillers. Oh and wow. He had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> awesome. So he would grade my paper uh-huh. as an A plus plus, and then he would grade Mike's as an A plus check, and we're like, "What does this mean?" And he's like, "I don't know. I'm on too many painkillers to find out." <laughs> so that's our rating scale now. <laughs> so our, our rating check? scale, yeah. So our rating scale right now is like label branding A plus plus check, and everyone's like, "What does that mean?" And we're like, "We don't even know. <laughs> we don't even know. We, we've, been dr- we've been drinking a lot of whiskey. We've been drinking." A lot of whiskey, right? It's amazing. At the end of it, we give like an 86 or a 90. Like we right. give an actual numerical grade at the end. But okay. the four categories that we rate on are basically nonsensical at this point. Right. Yeah, we, we try joke. to make it. Yeah, oh, we, we try to make so it realistic, but yeah. we got to bring it back. You know? But but what's that's funny a great is story. <laughs> absolutely. But because now our audience, they'll send us like text messages. Pain pills? Well, that too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're we're feeling no pain. <laughs> in more ways than none. They uh, time to start rating. They'll yep. try something and they're like, "This hasn't. This isn't on your spreadsheet because oh. all of our ratings are on a spreadsheet." Oh wow. Yeah. So you can, like anyone can see it, uh-huh. and they're like, "This one hasn't been tried yet." I give this one an A minus check. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sounds good. And I'm like, final rating? And they'll just like throw a number out. It's such a riot. They just they just wow, like take on to it. But it's, yeah, it's a good time. But for this, I mean, you have the people putting points on a bottle. Like, mm-hmm. It's marketing. It is, but they're also generally educated people within right. like a SOM level or something. They're actually, they're specifically educated people. It's just, yeah. it's just that, that wine, like anything, has been commodified. Mm-hmm. Sure. So it has to... It has to be on a scale. It has to justify its price. The sticker on the front of it is for the general public to actually right. have that vote of confidence that I'm willing to spend the money because I know somebody Correct. else has mm-hmm. said that this was Correct. actually good. What's this one? MSRP? Idea? Like, uh, what is oh, this so oh, for oh. here? Twenty nine ninety nine. Yes. 30, 30 bucks. bucks. Yeah, 30 yeah. bucks. 30 bucks. Yeah, I just bought it. Now, and this producer, really they, just wound up, they just wound up getting the, uh, I was told this at our last um, inventory meeting that we had with the, they got the highest rating for um, organic certification. Mm-hmm. So it is, and that's and that's by the European Union standards. So which are higher than the U.S. standards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're you know picking picking the grapes by the light of the moon. And that's they're using, very good. You know, they're using. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I know, dude. This is delicious. They're, I love that they're doing that. It's like, oh, it's a it's a full moon today. Tomorrow's an eclipse, so we should pull this tree down well, and we should grab from this bush. It's so it sound it's so. And this this goes all the way back to what we were talking about before about how it gets a little a little snobby, and you can get really, really, really you know to the point where it's like. It, where it becomes unreal. Mm-hmm. All right. 
that stuff matters to people like us. Yeah. Okay. It's the same way like pro athletes will sit around and they'll talk about like um, what specific exercise gave them that point zero one extra on mm-hmm. you know their their tests you know? and, and for whiskey it's the same thing this bottle of blantons was from a barrel that was in this Correct. rick house yeah. at this level of the warehouse it's for this whatever. for this long and so on and so i mean i, I can I, i've had conversations with people where we wax poetic about the 97 vintage mm-hmm. uh and that was worldwide uh, and that was yeah, yeah see and that was and, and they that got was, slammed with the 98 yeah yeah exactly and then, of, and then all of a sudden oh like, so the 97 was better than the 97 98? was the Na- icon. 97 sorry it was, it was icon no, no, no. no it was and then 98 it was, was a worldwide oh, it was worldwide a, it was a Terrible. celine dion huh yes. and then everything <laughs> no it's a taylor swift tyler tyler you fan her brother god i feel old but 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 then but then like 2001 also came around and then 2001 was a what happened to be happened to be a great year and then things they were what they were and then all of a sudden 2007 was especially for bordeaux interesting and that that ties into what we were talking about before with with, with climate change because i mean this is a crop mm-hmm. i mean people are they're growing it i mean you're not producing this in a lab but we're not making impossible meat Yet. you know i mean you have to be out in the vineyard you have to be conscientious and in order to make Good wine, you can't. You have to have the right combination of sun, uh, you know, soil. and soil and and water. Sure, and a lot of places because it goes back to, you know, the beginning for them. Whenever that was, they don't irrigate. They mm-hmm. just they they rely on mother nature. Now, this is. Can we just talk about how good this is, though? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes. Because this, the one before. I, I like that one too, but there was like a huge, it was sweet and then it dipped dry and then it came right back up can sweet I, again. Can I have more? This yes, was so insanely well rounded. Like, this just feels like you're drinking just silk. Like, so this is just beautiful. I don't that even really want to, I don't want to eat with this. I no. just want to sit here and just talk to people and just drink this. <laughs> Isn't Fantastic. it delicious? Yes. Yeah. It's silky smooth. It's, and it's funny because when you were talking about, Sideways came to mind uh-huh. because I was, I was going to tell you what the graves were. So it's sixty five percent Merlot, and then it's Cabernet and a little Petit Bordeaux that's added into it. So those are the grape varietals that are allowed to be used in Bordeaux. Mm. But as soon as I mentioned Merlot, I still think there's a side. You guys remember the movie Sideways? Or am I really dating myself on this? No, 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 no. I, I, I okay. use it all the time. So when we were talking about nineteen ninety seven and or nineteen ninety seven, yeah. and then the movie Sideways killed killed the Merlot industry because he was against Merlot. It still hasn't recovered. There's mm. it Seriously? Kinda, it's I stagnant. It's just a stagnant. It's a solid grape. You know, it's always going to yes. be there. It's never going to go away. It's never going to dip up a higher low, but it killed it. And the, the, the amount of demand for Pinot Noir was insane. It skyrocketed. I mean, that absolutely insane. So now I feel like I hesitate still to this day to tell people that there is Merlot that is blended <laughs> into a bottle or I to try Merlot. to sell a Merlot. Yeah, it's I, a great I, grape. It's a wonderful grape. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing versatile. grape. But um, yeah, so this is Merlot. And you know the real uh, irony, if we can just do the, a quick little movie review of, of Sideways. The, the last end? Yeah. At the very end when he cracks open the 61 Cheval Blanc, all right, which is the prize, it's the crown jewel of, and rightfully so, that's fucking brilliant bottle of wine <laughs> is it really oh it's unbelievable cheval blanc is one of the absolute and i think he has a grand crew uh mm-hmm. but with that being said it it, it, it the, the point is is like that's 70 percent merlot that's what's in that bottle so oh, he's he's hacking on merlot the whole and that's the irony mm-hmm. of it and then he goes he cracks open this bottle at the end and he drinks it with a, a cheeseburger that he gets it you know he doesn't even go to in and out he's just sitting and yeah. he's drinking out of a styrofoam cup so, so when you're and that's why it's so funny around Bordeaux is are there like Merlot Bordeaux like how do they market Bordeaux 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 how do they market them just Bordeaux As Bordeaux Bordeaux yeah, yeah. So because Bordeaux. again here's where the, the the rules come into place right. and the laws come into place because to the the person who knows the the laws they know that something from Bordeaux has to be either Cabernet Merlot Petit Bordeaux um, Cabernet Franc and, and Malbec. or Malbec in that in that bottle. Those are the only five grape varietals of reds that they are allowed to use. And I've had all of those, and they're all really good. They're all delicious. That's they really just, are. But and France definitely put them. That's on just that. so shocking to me because you can get a bottle of Bordeaux, and it could be 
a very wide range of tastes. Oh, yes, right. yes, exactly. It right. all depends on the. It depends on the great varietals. Yeah, that you're that's why that. terroir that's is so to important. And there's also right and left bank. Exactly, and we could really go into the weeds on that one. That's literally just saying like this is Kentucky. Have fun. It's it's thirty four percent. Thirty four percent. No, it's fourteen percent. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's thirty four proof. <laughs> it's fourteen percent. Fourteen percent alcohol. Yeah. Now, now that's that, that's that, crazy. That's, now that's also misleading because by law you can fluctuate between you know by by one percentage. All right. Point. So let me go ahead and explain <laughs> this one. So <clears throat> I'm learning so much. A couple years ago, <clears throat> there was um, some massive tariffs that were introduced. Oh, into by the US. someone. So um, on, especially on wine, yeah. they hit the wine market. So Is this after 2016? Yes, this yes. is after 2016. Yes, by he who not so, be not be so, um, so we there there were loopholes that you 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 tried to find. Okay. So the the 25% tariff was on anything that was under 14% alcohol coming from from Europe. So they jacked it to 14.5. So we got everybody <laughs> that we knew and <laughs> said to them crank up that alcohol <laughs> exactly because the 25 percent tariff we would much rather pay the customs on duties on a higher percentage of alcohol than pay that 25 percent tariff, the tariff. Because, now, it, because eventually the consumer ends up suffering on the end right sure, sure. So now is that still in place no no that, that is not of, in place that was one of the first things that the current, current administration got rid of, got rid of. right yeah understood correct yeah. and because they were actually they were anticipating they wanted to and were supposed to actually blanket it, like cover our loopholes, so it was going to be any kind of wine that was coming through at 25%. What yeah. was the point? Yeah, why does alcohol always because get the short Because something about the two airlines, Boeing and, and Airbus. And Airbus got into some kind of litigation where they – it, it had nothing to do with the industry whatsoever. No, it had nothing no, to do with so the commodities that they were actually taxing with the cheeses from right and, and Irish whiskey. That was another thing that got mm-hmm. yeah. Scotch, yeah. Scotch, Scotch and Scotch. It was yeah. kind of like picking and choosing what they were right, going right. after. It was it was pure. It was just spiked. It, it was just debt. legit politics. Was, right. And and, yeah, and the fact so that, annoying. And the fact I, I believe that it was one of those things where whether that person wanted to or not, you know, go after just one thing. That's when the government nerds were like, no, you don't understand. All this stuff is like tied mm-hmm. together. Like, you know, we do business like w- like it's like how the tariff is like written yeah. is what I had heard. Yeah. It because didn't I was, benefit the, the consumer whatsoever. No. It actually hurt the consumer. And it didn't even hurt the makers. It didn't. It you know? didn't. It just hurt the people who were importing yeah. and who would that's eventually how tariffs work. <laughs> put it on to the people in the U.S. Right. and the consumer. Yeah. So that's why we were frustrated as well. Right. So, yes, you'll notice um, some of the Europeans getting higher in alcohol. Normally... Normally, our Bordeaux is anywhere from 13.7 to 14.5%. Yeah. But they try to stay maintain that mid-13%. But oh, also, the higher so the good. alcohol, the longer the ageability. That's, that's true. Now, that's my next question because there's that's that's like the black market of wine. It's like, I'm going to pick up this year. I'm going to age it for X amount of time. And then I have an app that tells me when I should open the bottle because Can then it's going to be like peak. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's a full. Oh, yeah. that's a, You guys know about that. You must. I don't need no, an no, app. No, no, no. We don't need an app. <laughs> They're like, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to drink Didn't it. Didn't I tell you no, how no, no, good it's, we are? Yes. Yeah. I'm just so interested that wine ages in a bottle. Like, it's <coughs> yeah, quite that's, so that's that's a whole unique. Yeah, that's a whole separate podcast. Yeah. So, with if I were to buy well, we this off the shelf. We could talk about that in a separate wine item. Separate we could do round two. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I were to buy this today, uh-huh. and I give it to somebody on Thanksgiving, I'm like, hey, thanks. Appreciate you for hosting. Whatever. Now, I don't have to deal with my energy bill being <laughs> $7,000 for this month. Right. <laughs> Am I supposed to drink this immediately or should I let this sit? Because it's a 2016, it's now 2022. Like, is it at a point where it should just be consumed within a year? No, 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 no. As far as the consumption is concerned, no. How do you not but, ruin but this? But you should open, if you open the bottle, at least, like when you go over to Thanksgiving and yeah. you say, thanks for having me here, I'm going to open this bottle because we should drink it in 30 minutes to an hour or two hours. We should let it open because it's been closed for so long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so let it breathe for 30 minutes. Let it breathe. And it's a cancer, which is why it has 90 points. Let it open uh, up. 92, actually, I believe. Let it breathe. Yes. <laughs> 90 the, and the 92. The decanter rating is 90. Right, but James Suckling, suckling said it's like a 92. 92. Oh, the yeah. Suckling mm-hmm. rating, yes. yes. Oh, so, yes. no, no. It, 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 it's all like, <laughs> what you're saying is like. It, James Suckling is a person for anybody who doesn't right. know. We're not throwing jokes. So. No, no, we're not. But uh, if you're asking, like, is, is this wine at its peak? Most most wineries are making wine to be consumed. I mean, that's the whole point. Sure. Um, so that's yes, a good point. yes, Very there good point. there are that without a doubt, without a doubt, there are wines that are out there that 
you know, they're... Uh, That's th- what they're doing. And people want higher alcohol. The demand and in the U.S. is for higher alcohol percentage. True. And, but then there's also people out there where they're like, this wine isn't ready for another decade. You know, I mean, and uh, some of them are like the Barolos and, you know, Amarones and some of your Grand Crus of, you know, both Burgundy and, and Bordeaux where they're like, yeah, you could look at it and be like, oh, 2006. And you're like, <laughs> no, no, it's it's really it's it, now it's ready now that it's 2022. And it all again, this all goes back to where it was produced, who made the wine weather conditions well the everything. biggest the biggest thing is storage yes i mean that's the biggest thing whether yeah, no it's going to be damaged and transport and and what you've done with it since it's been over over onto the port but typically something that's either higher in alcohol or from a specific producer will have ageability for anywhere from five to ten years right guaranteed five to ten years okay if you go above that then you need to check the criteria behind that wine you do any wineries it? actually put this in a bottle and say it's in a bottle but don't drink it for 10 years. Yes. Yeah. Do they really? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's the stuff for collectors. The larger wine houses do. I feel like yes. it's so weird. Yeah, the, yeah. especially from France. Yes. If I'm going to put it out for Spain. sale, it's not ready, though. Right. Well, that's mean, just a weird concept to me. It is, but at the same time, you got to remember the, the clientele. Because mm-hmm. there's, such, there's so much capital to be gained when a wine has been aged and then... It that appreciates whole, in value. Absolutely. Yes. And yeah. then you also have the fact that it's aging within the bottle. Right. So they plan for that. And they also know that there's a, there's a specific, you know, niche market that's going to buy a bottle for their firstborn. But like I feel for like, like that, major milestones. And they're right. like, this is something that you should open in six years. There's there's eight billion people on the planet. Somebody's planning their firstborn and around a, a bottle of wine. Well, but I feel also, like that's yeah. what adds yeah, to the pretentiousness of wine, though. It's like, I'm going to put this out. But don't open it for ten years. It's like well, then just hold but on to well, it. That's what and then but open they it don't, though. Years. I mean, most most of those wineries, they work by like you you, you sign up and you get on a waiting list. Yeah. And there are a lot of French producers where they're just selling directly to the Chinese, like they're because they're just buying it all up. Yeah, you know whether <laughs> it's old or, or 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 new stuff. Well, that brings us to another discussion. Because yeah, yes, that's, when that's China, also it, what, no. But yeah. honestly, when uh, when the Chinese hit, like when they started the wealthiness and spending the money, they like Bordeaux couldn't keep anything in stock, and no, they were really? selling straight no, to Asia, and they were they were mortified and happy at the same time. And I don't know if I'm being politically correct in any certain way, but because they were mm-hmm. taking these powerhouses, the the Chateau Lafitte's of the world, and right. they would pop them open and like they drink them, them on a Tuesday mix them with Coca-Cola because <laughs> yeah. they wanted it sweet they're, they're really known for liking sweet so they were kind of bastardizing the brand but the big houses didn't care because they, they were, were making actually so selling. much I mean, money they were making, they were a making so money. much money and they still are but a lot of the big houses do really have a reputation and they like to keep that rep- you know, reputation like the Lafitte's and mm-hmm. the Rothschilds and of the world and um that's fascinating. But, yeah, I mean. So this specific winery, course. this Bordeaux winery, what was, how did that work with you guys bringing them on for your portfolio? Okay, so this, again, is another unique story. So there was, they, so this, again, are two daughters that took over their parents' chateau. Um, and how we got in touch with them is because one of the daughters was over here interning for the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board, and that's where she met her husband, in uh who is from uniontown so she would come back to pittsburgh often so that's how we got into contact with them small world they now live at the chateau and she does marketing they own two properties they have chateau haute bizac and they also have chateau de tort which is also in the shelves at addie's um Le so one from right uh, right bank and one from left bank both both are merlot based though um and we just we started bringing our product because of the relationship and really enjoyed it and it was something that needed we we needed to fill the portfolio and now she has they have a few off labels like um, branched out labels that are more um, is that Emmanuel that you're talking about yeah oh okay. yeah so like B from Bordeaux that are more tr- that are trendier mm, right uh, and for a, a younger generation yeah, yeah more f- like new new labels not the old like. Stutchy stuff, Tim. but really yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Uh, stainless steel, but that's how we got involved with them. We really like the product. They're this solid. is very good. Again. Good. It's delicious. Thank you. Yes. Very nice job. 
So do you guys have a website or anything that people can go to to check out what wines you distribute, where you distribute to, what the ratings are for some of these wines? Yes. So it's uh, vivinoselections.com. Please not to be confused with, with the Vivino app. We are not associated, are not associated with them. Oh, whatsoever. really? <laughs> well, where did the name Vivino come from? Um, uh, Mark and his, uh, he, it's basically dedicated to his father. Hmm. So it was, um, it was life and wine put together as Vivino. Oh, cool. Like vivo and yeah. vino. So Vivino. But are you, are you on social media too? We are at Vivino Selections. On both Instagram and Facebook? Correct. Okay. And then people can look up. We online. do more on, fa- yeah. on Instagram than we do Facebook. Okay. So don't so be disappointed if you look on our Facebook page. So can people look up Chateau Holt Bizac <laughs> they and can. Uh, see where it's located? So on our website, we'll have different countries that you can click on. And under those countries will be the wineries that we, we have That's from sweet. those countries. And then you can click on there and it'll actually link you to their websites right. as well. That's pretty cool. I like this nice. Flores de Calejo, but nice. I like this f- French wine. Yeah. Yes. That was fantastic. Is this your first French? No, no, <laughs> okay. no. Okay. But it was just very good. Okay. okay. Very well rounded. Well, well thank uh, you. to kind of put a, the, I guess you could say, uh, a nail in, in that coffin of where we were talking about, the same way, like, I know whiskey snobs, and mm-hmm. I used to be a whiskey snob, and I'm now a wine snob. Uh, whatever you're drinking and that you're enjoying, that's the best wine. Mm-hmm. All right. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it happens to be two buck Chuck who, God bless him. I mean, he passed away. Uh, or it, it's it's one of these fancy French or, or or whatever. I I was taught that by one of my mentors when I was you know first first getting started in this business, where he was just like never talk down to anybody, mm-hmm. whatever they like. That you know he's like we're here to sell wine. That's and that's <laughs> the beauty of wine. And the same exactly. as with his, I can't tell. I can tell you what I like. Mm-hmm. I can tell you what I think you might like. But you have your own sense of style and mm-hmm. what you like. Right. So that's the beauty of wine. Sure. You know, like I'm sure I don't know if you guys. Have, I'm sure you've had it. I've had it, and I don't understand the fascination. But mellow corn, yes, yeah, okay, and I don't get it. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't know if I'll ever get it. You know, um, and and that's the same way. Like you know, my wife thinks I'm insane for enjoying Sauvignon Blanc. To her, she's like, it smells like cat pee and sadness. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really, and uh, and and, and, and anybody, else. <laughs> yeah, right, right. anybody out there with cats. But uh, th- that being said, it's like everybody likes what they like. And, you know, there's no there's nothing y- you're not wrong, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and right. it's, sh- you know, the, the whole let's uh, we want to try and destigmatize. Right. You know, that whole thing. Like sure. that, that's why I never when people say, oh, I like sweet. I'm like, great. OK, I've got, you know, I may not have something here now, mm-hmm. you know, while I'm doing this tasting, but there's stuff in my portfolio and I like sweet. It's like if I'm having ripping hot curries or or Thai food or something like that, you need a sweet wine to counteract that sugar in the wine is going to counteract the chili spice, and sometimes you're going to have you know a, a dessert that doesn't have any sugar in it, so you want that little bit of of, of sugar. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Put it this way, it's okay to drink a bottle of wine a night. It's yeah. not okay to drink a bottle of whiskey, but it's okay to drink a bottle. It's socially acceptable. Speak for yourself, right. Ron. Yeah. <laughs> well. And it's actually, it's fun to experiment. Yeah. There, yes, that's so the whole thing. There's so many different options sure. out the there. That's yeah. Just get creative. Wine is fun. Yeah. I also love that you brought the pour out. Like, we thought we weren't going to finish yeah, the really. glass. With these selections, why would you do that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> these are also good. I would probably drink the mix at the end <laughs> yeah. and just go full college freshman. Yeah. Still would be considered a burdo. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I have a rosé if you want to try. We yeah. forgot to pull out the rosé. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe as we pack up. But thank you guys so much. Day. I sure, appreciate you. you. It was fun. Cheers. I don't have anything Cheers. left in my glass I'm, because I'm everything was delicious. But well, seriously. I think there's I'm some, just trying up empty. some left here. Okay, right? that's fine. Thank you so Thank much, you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Thank you guys. Let's do a proper. You can't toast without anything in it. It was such bad luck. Yeah, that sinks the ship, dude. It sinks yeah. the ship. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Any excuse. All right. Well, thank yeah. you guys. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. Happy holidays. Cheers. Cheers. Happy, holidays. Happy holidays. Wonderful. Thank you guys. Good times. Great old New York.